In the Build a Bouquet page of the Hansel and Petal site, some flowers are available in a choice of colours, and the name of the colour is embedded in the image file name. So when I selected a yellow calla lily, I got a yellow image here, but I still need to have the colour displayed here. We need to extract that from the file name. So let's see how the file names are structured. Let's go to the editing program. And here we are in bouquet.php, and this is the select menu for calla lilies. And the value for each option is the file name. And it always begins with a number, an underscore, a name, an underscore, and the colour. Number, underscore, name, underscore, colour. So we've got this pattern, and it runs all the way through the page. Always the same. The colour is the third element. We need to treat this like an array. And there's a very useful function that will split a string into an array, and that is called explode. So we'll use that to create our own little custom function to extract the colour from each of the file names. So we need to go to the order page, and we'll go down to the bottom of the code block at the top of the page and insert a new line. To create a custom function, you use the function keyword. And then after the function keyword, you give the function a name that you like. doesn't matter what it is. It mustn't contain any spaces or funny punctuation. But the best thing to do is to give it a descriptive name. What we want to do is we want to get a color. So that's exactly what I'm going to call my function. Then after the function name, a pair of parentheses. That's where the arguments go. So I'm going to add an argument called file name. If you want to add more arguments, you separate them with commas. Even if you don't want any arguments, you must still have those parentheses. Then after the closing parenthesis, an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace, and everything that happens inside the function goes between those braces. Let's get to work inside the function. What we want to do is to split that file name up into its component parts to make it an array. So I'll give it a variable called parts, and then use the explode function. And the first argument to explode is whatever string you want to use as the explosive device, I suppose you could call it, whatever it is you want to split it up on. We want to use the underscore to split it, so as a string, underscore, and then the string that you want to work on, which will be file name. That's the argument that we're passing to our function. And the color is going to be the third array element. So color equals, and then it will be parts, two, because of course arrays are counted from zero, so the third element is the element number two, has the index two. Now we want to make it uppercase, we want to make the first letter uppercase, so let's pass parts two to uc first. We've met that before, it just makes the first letter of a string uppercase, and then we'll return the color. Now, if you have been very, very observant, you might have noticed that I've used color as my variable inside the function. And if we scroll back up here, you'll see that I'm also using color as an array. And you must be thinking, what an idiot this guy is. Well, I must admit, that when I first created this, I thought, well, it was a little bit of a silly thing to do. But it actually points out something very important about the way functions work, because inside the function, color is completely separate from the color outside. So this, in fact, wouldn't make any difference. A function works like a little black box. But still, it's not a very good way to do things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of color. And in fact, I'm going to get rid of color here, because I don't need to save it as a variable, all I need to do is to return the value of uc first and parts two, and that does exactly what my function needs it to do. So we've now got the function. All we need to do is to get the color to display in our little loop. So let's go down to the loop. 
and it's in this table cell on line 82 that we need to display the colour, but not every flower has a choice of colours, so we need an if-else structure to display the colour. So let's put that in there. We'll add a couple of extra lines just to make it clearer what we're doing. And then if, and we need to check, is set colour, and then we're looking for a particular type of flower, so it'll be flower name. If that's set, then inside that block we need to display the colour. So we'll use echo, because that will do the displaying, but then we need to get the colour, so we'll use the get colour function and pass to it colour flower name as the argument. But as I say, not every flower has a choice of colours, so we need an else block in there. So else echo and then we'll have a non-breaking space so that nothing funny happens to our table. NBSP, that HTML entity, goes in there like that. And we just need a closing curly brace, otherwise we will have a nasty syntax error. And that's all we need to do. Let's save it. Go to the browser. We'll go to the Builder Bouquet page and we'll select some with colours. Let's have a couple of calla lilies. We'll have iris, which doesn't have a colour, but gerbera daisies do. We'll choose pink, and that'll do. Add to basket. There we are, calla lilies, colour yellow, and it's uppercase, the first letter. That's the UC first working there, and pink, again, uppercase. It's all working absolutely perfectly. So the custom function that I've built contains only a few lines of code and it's only used once on the page but it makes the code in the loop a lot simpler and clearer. The body of a custom function can contain any PHP code including if and else conditions and it can also use built-in PHP functions. I've used explode and uc first. It's simply a way of wrapping up a routine that you either want to use multiple times or you want to move away from the main code. Values passed to a function as arguments remain unchanged by anything that happens inside the function. You use the return keyword to capture the changed value for use in your main script. Among its many talents, PHP is capable of handling calculations from simple arithmetic to much more complex mathematics. The order confirmation page in the Hansel and Petal site needs just some basic multiplication and addition. What we need to do is to add the cost here and then to add a total at the end and add a shipping charge if the total comes to less than $75. So let's get to work in the order page. Go to the editing program and then in order.php let's create a variable to store the total. We'll put that at the top here the end of the first block, set total to zero. And then in the loop, in the table, we need to find the cell that displays the price. There it is with a dollar sign. The dollar sign will be a literal dollar sign. It won't be part of the PHP. So the PHP block goes immediately after that. And inside there, what we need to do is to calculate the cost. So the cost will be amount, that's the number of flowers selected, and it will be times. In PHP, we use the asterisk for the multiplication sign, and then it will be from the price array. We're looking for that particular flower name. So that will get us the cost, but we want to display the cost. And we could add another line and do echo cost on that next line, but in fact, we can echo the cost, do the calculation in the same thing. Why am I saving it as cost? Because I actually want to add it to the total. So add on another line, and then we need to add that value to the total. We need to use a special assignment operator. We want to add, keep on adding the same value again, so it's plus equals cost. It's the same as saying total equals total plus cost. 
It's just a shorthand way of writing that. So let's just save that and test it. We'll go back to the other page. We'll just order a couple of quick flowers. There we are. There is the cost being displayed for each one that we've selected. So that's fine. That is definitely working. So let's go back to our code and continue working with it. So what we need to do is to display the shipping charge and the total. We need two new rows in the table and they need to go outside the for each loop because if you put them inside the for each loop, they'll be repeated every single time we go through. So that is one of the reasons that I use this alternative way, end for each. It makes it much easier to find out exactly where you are. So what we need to do after the end for each is to add a couple of table rows. And in that we need TD and it needs to span four columns. We'll call that shipping. So there we are, we've got the two extra rows that we need in our table to display the shipping and the total. So we now need to add the code to calculate the shipping and that goes in this table cell here. We'll add a PHP block. And it's a decision making block. So if, and the condition is total, is less than 75. And then we need a pair of curly braces for that block. And in there, we will echo then a string $10. Now, don't confuse that. That is not a variable. Although it's got a dollar sign on it, it can't be a variable because variables cannot begin with a number immediately after the dollar sign. Anyway, it's within single quotes, so all we would see would be that actual value, a dollar sign followed by 10. We now need to add that value to the total. So total plus equals and then the number 10, not a string, and that adds up the total. But if it's $75 or more, we're going to offer free shipping. So we need an else block. And inside that else block, we will echo free. And all that remains is in this cell down here is to display the total. And we'll display it with a literal dollar sign, which will go outside of the PHP block echo total. So let's just save that page and we'll go to our browser and we'll go back to the build a bouquet page and we'll build a new bouquet. Just choosing a few flowers at random just to check that it works. And JavaScript works out that it should come to $33. Let's see if PHP agrees. Add to basket. There we are. It actually does agree. It says $43. It's added in $10 for shipping because it was less than $75. And if you test it by adding a lot of flowers, more than $75 worth, then of course the shipping would be free. So the order confirmation page really looks great now, but there is a problem. Although the confirm order button is only a dummy link, just imagine for a moment that it does work. See what happens if you decide to look at another page before clicking it. So I'm going to go to our designers and then I'm going to click view my order, the link at the top here. Your basket is empty. What has happened is that when you move away to another page, the post array is refreshed every single time a page is requested. The data has been passed from the form to the next script, which was the order PHP, but it's lost unless you do something to preserve the data. And that's our next task. Data submitted from a form is passed through the post or get array to the next page or script, but it's not automatically preserved. It's the job of the processing script to do something with the data before it's cleared from the server's memory. Often that's not a problem, because the script that processes the form data will insert it into a database or send it as an email message. But if you want the data to remain available after the user moves to another page, you need to store it. 
One way to do so is to store it in hidden form fields in the next page. But if the user goes to a different page, rather than the one that processes the hidden form fields, the data disappears into cyber oblivion. You need a more robust way of preserving the data until it's no longer needed. A common way of doing so is to use cookies. These are name value pairs that are stored in the browser and they're sent to the web server with each page request. The disadvantage with cookies is that the same information has to make a round trip to the server each time a page is requested. PHP offers an alternative approach using sessions. Sessions are similar to cookies. The difference is that the data is sent only once to the server where it's stored as session variables. The browser stores only one piece of information, a unique token that identifies the session. When a new page is requested, the browser sends the session ID to the server. If the script in the page uses session variables, the server retrieves the data and uses it to build the web page that's sent back. This makes it possible to preserve form data until it's needed or to keep users logged into a site. All that's needed to create a PHP session is to add the command session start as close to the top of the script as possible. It doesn't need to be the first PHP statement in the page, but it must come before you use session variables, and it must come before any output is sent to the browser. Session variables are created by assigning values to the session array. Like post and get, this is another of PHP's super global arrays. It's an associative array, so to create a session variable called quantity, just put the variable name in quotes between a pair of square brackets after session and assign it a value in the normal way. To save an associative array as a session variable, use two pairs of square brackets. The array name goes in the first pair of brackets and the variable name goes in the second pair. In this example, an associative array called quantity is being saved as a session variable and it's got two elements, daffodils and daisies. Once stored as session variables, these values become available in all pages in the same site that begin with session start. Not all pages in a site need to use session start, only those where you want to access session variables. The order confirmation page of the Hansel and Petal site processes the post array after the user submits the form from the Builder Bouquet page. But the script in this page doesn't do anything to preserve the data, so there would be no data for this confirm order button to process. Now we won't be going as far as building a complete e-commerce site in this course, but let's see how to use session variables to preserve data from page to page. So let's go to the editing program and it's order.php that we've got open. Before you can use session variables, you need to create a PHP session with session start. And we're going to need the session variables in this page, even if it's accessed without clicking the bouquet submit button. So session start must go outside the if statement at the top. So let's put it on line two. Session underscore start then an empty pair of parentheses and a semicolon. That gives us access to a session and to session variables. The data that needs to be preserved is currently stored in the color, quantity and image associative arrays, which have been initialized as empty arrays just before the for each loop on lines four through six. The session array is one of PHP's super globals that's generated automatically so we no longer need to initialize the arrays up here. So let's get rid of those three lines. Now to convert color into a session variable, we need to add an underscore after the dollar sign, then session, all in capital letters, and then the actual variable name becomes the array key, and that goes in square brackets and also as a string. So this is now a session variable called color, and it actually becomes a multidimensional array. This second pair of square brackets will add the flower name. So the first time that the loop runs, 
this becomes session, colour, colour lilies. And the next time that we come to a colour one, it becomes session, colour, gerbera daisies, and so on. So we need to do exactly the same with the quantity and image arrays. So let's make that a session array, or a session variable rather, part of the session array. So it's the current variable name that becomes the array key, and it goes in quotes inside the square brackets. So we've now converted the colour, quantity and image arrays to session variables inside the for each loop. So what we now have to do is replace all the variables that use colour, quantity and image with those session variables in the rest of the script. And the simple way to do that is with your editing program's find and replace dialog box. So I'm in Dreamweaver, edit, find and replace. I'm going to look in the current document, search in the source code, and I'm going to find color, and I'm going to replace it with dollar underscore then session, all in capitals, square bracket, quote, color. That looks fine to me, and then just replace all. It's done everything that I wanted to do. Then open my find and replace box again. And what I need to do this time is to find quantity, dollar quantity. And I want to replace that with dollar underscore session. Make sure I spell session correctly. And then quantity goes as the string. It becomes the key. That's spelled correctly. Replace all and once more with feeling, this time we do it for image and it will be session and the array key will be image and replace all. And then I can close that rather annoying box there. And if I just scroll through my page, I should see that, yes, it's been replaced as session variables. And they work just exactly the same as the variables that we've been working with right up to now. So, the moment of truth, let's save the page and go to our browser. We'll go to build a bouquet. We'll build a very quick bouquet. Only a couple of items. We'll add it to our basket. We've got calla lilies and sunflowers. Let's go to our designers and come back to view my order. The only problem is we've got this undefined variable price here. Now I can assure you this isn't something that I planned, but errors do happen. What we need to do is to find out why price is undefined. It's not one of our session variables, so that gives me a little bit of a clue as to why it might be undefined, but the answer always lies in the code. So let's go back to our editing program and we need to scroll up. Price was in the top block. There it is, there's the price array. And a lot of editing programs allow you to match opening and closing braces and opening and closing parentheses. In Dreamweaver, it's called balance braces, and it's this little icon here. So if I click that, the first time it gives me those opening and closing parentheses. The next time, let's see what that shows us. And it shows me that we're inside this if block. So the price is only being set if we've submitted the form. So that's the answer. Let's grab the price definition. We just need to take that. We need to cut it. We can delete that line. And it just needs to go outside of that closing curly brace of the if block. Paste it back. We'll save. Then we'll go back to our browser and we'll view my order again. And there we are. The variable is no longer undefined. We've got the price and the session variables have also been retained. So the values stored in the session variables preserve the data submitted from the Builder Bouquet page wherever you go in the site, and they could be used to complete the checkout process. However, the purpose isn't to show you how to build an online store. The code you would need for that is far more complex. 
The purpose here has been to show you how to preserve the value of form data as the user moves from page to page within a site. You can also use session variables to store any data. For example, you could store someone's name and user privileges after they log in. But you also need a way to delete the data when it's no longer needed. And we'll look at that next. Storing values in session variables is useful, but you should always delete them and end the PHP session when they're no longer needed. You can delete individual session variables, and there's also a quick way to delete them all. In the Hansel and Petal site, let's start by selecting some flowers. So, pink calla lilies, we'll have three of those, and we'll have... Oh, let's have five Peruvian lilies, and we'll have some roses. Yellow rose. I'm not from Texas, but we'll have some yellow roses. And then we'll add to the basket. So they're listed there, calla lilies, Peruvian lilies, and roses. So let's try to delete or to unset the session variable for Peruvian lilies. We need to go back to our editing program to work on that. So here we are in order.php. And at the top of order.php, beginning on line 3, we've got an if block, and that runs code only if post bouquet has been set. In other words, if we've submitted from the form in build a bouquet. So we must make sure that our code to unset the session variable goes outside of that if block, because otherwise it would only run if we've come from the form. We want to unset it wherever we've come from, so we need to go down below that block. I'm going to use my balance braces in Dreamweaver to find the end of that block, there we are, price array. So we can unset down here, outside of the if block. And the argument that unset takes is the name of the variable that you want to unset. So it's a session variable. Now the question is, which session variable do we need to unset? We don't have a session variable for Peruvian lilies. The session variables are up here. They're color, quantity, and image. And if we scroll down a little bit, let's find where we're actually displaying things. What we're doing on line 70 is we're using a for each loop and we're looking at session quantity as flower name. So what we would need to do is to get rid of session quantity, Peruvian lilies. Right, now we know what we want to do. Let's go back. So it's unset session and then an opening bracket. So it's the quantity, closing bracket, and then another opening bracket for our Peruvian lilies. So, and that's got an underscore in the middle of it. So there we are, we're unsetting session quantity Peruvian lilies. Let's save that, go back to our browser, and we'll go to another page and we'll come back to view my order. And Peruvian lilies are no longer there because we've unset the quantity of Peruvian lilies so it doesn't appear within that loop. So that's how you unset a single session variable, but very often you want to clear the whole session array. So let's create a script for this cancel order button. Let's go back to our editing program. And we no longer need this unset here, so just let's comment that out. We need to go down to the bottom of the page to find the cancel order button. And there it is on line 114, and the name is cancel. And there is no action in the opening form tag, so that means that the page will simply reload when the button is clicked. So we can add a decision-making block at the top here. We'll put it after that unset. And if, then is set, and we are looking for the post array, because the form is submitted using the post method, and it's post cancel that we want to look for, and that will mean that the cancel button has been clicked. And if that happens, what we need to do inside that block is to set the session array to an empty array. So it's dollar sign underscore session all in caps equals 
array, then a pair of parentheses and a semicolon, and that just makes it an empty array. So all of the session variables are destroyed. But the other thing which we need to do is to end the session, and that is done with session underscore destroy, which is also followed by a pair of parentheses and a semicolon. And that's all that you need. We clear the session array and then we destroy the session. So let's just save that page and go back to our browser. And if I click cancel order, that runs. Your basket is now empty. Session variables are associated with a unique session ID. So this removes only those session variables associated with that ID. And then it deletes the ID. If the user submits the Builder Bouquet form again, a new session will be created and the new data will be stored as a fresh set of session variables.